this episode, we're going back in time. Not with the Doctor, but with the female pioneers of electronic music, who made everything from this famous theme to the Coca-Cola pop and pour sound. As brought to light in the new documentary, Sisters with Transistors. Here's pioneer Suzanne Chiani on what it was like to be a female composer in the 70s. We, as women, have all come to understand that we were not alone. As women in our field, we were always the only one in our, you know, immediate circumstance. And because, maybe because we worked in isolation, we didn't know each other. So I didn't know Delia Derbyshire. I didn't know Daphne Oram. And now it's just this uh, revelation to see that we have a context and a connection. It's opened up just... uh, an energy system for us. I'll also be chatting to the writer and director of the doc, Lisa Rovner, plus two contemporary female composers who are making waves in electronic music today. Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. I'm going to get that gun of mine, and I'm going to change you from a rooster to a hen with one shot. Some people call me a freak. I hate that word. I don't believe in it. Better yet, I don't believe in labels. You know, I think you're the only girl in the world that can stand on a stage with a spotlight in her eye and still see a diamond inside a man's pocket. Because I'm up at five every morning working my ass off. Does someone want to just tell me to my face, you're never going to give me the scores I deserve? Hello, I'm your host, Anna Smith. And today we're talking about the excellently named doc, Sisters with Transistors. Written and directed by Lisa Rovner, this harmonic history delves into the sounds and stories of electronic music's pioneering female composers. Technology is a tremendous liberator. It blows up power structures. It unearths the women who embraced machines and transformed the way we produce and listen to music today. But they've been largely buried by history, with the emphasis on his Somehow women get forgotten from the history. The history of women has been a story of silence, of breaking through the silence. With beautiful noise. is in partnership with Modern Films. Later, I'll be joined by the contemporary electronic composers Shiva Fesharaki and Elizabeth Bernholz, aka Gazelle Twim. But first, I'm talking to the writer and director of Sisters with Transistors, Lisa Rovner, and to the pioneer Suzanne Chiani, who's featured in the film. Suzanne is a five-time Grammy Award-nominated composer. And you'll likely be familiar with some of her work. She created the Coca-Cola sound that you heard at the start of the show. She provided the voice and sounds for Bally's groundbreaking Xenon pinball machine. She composed the Columbia Pictures opening theme. And she was one of the first solo women to score a Hollywood movie, The Incredible Shrinking Woman, starring Lily Tomlin. Well, Lisa and Suzanne, welcome to Girls on Film. Hello, Anna. Thank you for inviting me today. And hi, Lisa. Hello. (laughs) (laughs) Well, um, I know you two know each other, obviously. So congratulations to you both on Sisters with Transistors and also to the wonderful work that you both do. Uh, Let's start with Lisa. Tell me why you wanted to make this film. Yeah, well, it all starts when I discovered a timeline of female pioneers in electronic music. And I really didn't know many of the women featured in that timeline. So immediately piqued my interest. It was really the images of these women with their machines that really kind of piqued my interest. And when I started looking into or listening to their sounds, I was just amazed. I had heard of Delia Derbyshire and Eliane Radig, but hadn't heard of Suzanne, hadn't heard of Daphne Oram or Bibi Barron or what Pauline Oliveros or Eliane Radig. I'd heard an album, but yeah, so, or Laurie Spiegel. But um, it was really when I realized that they were amongst the greatest pioneers of modern sound that I was compelled to break the silence that surrounded their stories. What I was attracted to was that, you know, these were women with agency who were truly independent and their stories were stories of liberation. This sound was the sound of liberation. So many things that interest me personally that all kind of came together. And then 
yeah, just also when I discovered the archive, I was just blown away. I just felt so, I really just related to what I was experiencing, hearing and seeing on screen or on the internet. To me, electronic music wasn't about making Baroque music with new timbres. It was a different kind of music. You just had the summer of love. Everything we knew was being thrown out. And it was a whole new world. Electronics were part of that world. What are they? Oh, these are patch cords. The archive footage is extraordinary. We'll, we'll come to that in a minute. But um, I wanted to ask Suzanne, when did you first meet Lisa? Was it making this film? Yes, it was. Some time ago, Lisa came to Bellinas with this concept of doing a film. And I, you know, I had just been participating in a film documentary about my life called A Life in Waves. And I actually was very ignorant of the whole context of my career. And I hadn't ever considered it in the perspective that Lisa had. But I have to say that I didn't understand right away So when I heard the name Sisters with Transistors, I thought, oh, no, (laughs) that's, that's, you know, it's too hip for me. I don't know. It's just uh, like Rosie the Riveter. And uh, so I was quite astonished by the beauty and the depth and the the film that she made. I am, I'm in awe of what she's done. So, uh, you know, she just went away. I guess we did an interview. She went away and she did all her work all over the world. She managed to get footage that people had never seen before. She was so committed to the project. And in that period of time that she's been making this film, we as women have all come to understand that we were not alone. As women in our field, we were always the only one in our you know, immediate circumstance. And because maybe because we worked in isolation, we didn't know each other. So I didn't know Delia Derbyshire. I didn't know Daphne Oram. And now it's just this uh, revelation to see that we have a context and a connection. It's opened up just uh, an energy system for us. So the word sisters is right. You know, you found your sisters through this doc. That's incredible. I mean, Lisa, talk to me a little bit more about sourcing the archive footage because some of it, I mean, particularly the theremin stuff, I was just agog. It was uh, bewitching to watch it. it. There was a sense of discovery just watching it. So tell me about actually discovering that yourself. Yeah, it was the archive research was a very long process. You know, originally I thought that we would be able to, you know, we would hire an archivist as you always see at the end of documentaries that have archive, you have archivists and it's not the director. It was very, very quickly we realized that there was just no way that we were going to get what we needed to make this film with in a traditional way. So it was going to take a lot of dedication and a lot of time. So I kind of took the challenge on and it was the archive was kind of spread out. This is the problem with a lot of these her stories. You know, they're not all in one place. So obviously the archive of Delia and Daphne was a, a lot easier to kind of get hold of because it was mainly housed at the BBC. But some of the some of the archive, the Clara Rockmore footage that you're talking about where she's performing, I'd seen a little bit of that on on YouTube, but I tracked down the footage and then discovered there was just this whole, you know, 30 minute conversation and she performed many pieces in that archive. And it was just so exciting to see stuff I hadn't seen before. And then the actual footage of Clara as a young girl that I I got from the family. Again, I had no idea that that even existed when I started making the film, but seeing her at that time, at that age, I mean, it's just, it was beyond exhilarating to, because I really feel like in that footage, you really get a sense of who she is. You know, you get a sense of her charisma, her curiosity, her playfulness. And that was kind of the way it was with most of the archive that I discovered. Suzanne's archive was very, very well organized. So that was like a joy but one of the clips at the beginning of the film of Suzanne this black and white this concert footage from 1974 that took a lot of work to get but we we managed and I'm just so thrilled to be able to share it with the world because same thing it's just it's such a charming moment and you just it's just so easy to fall in love with Suzanne and the sounds
And then some of the, you know, Paulina Oliveros archive, her work is, her archive is kind of spread out. So in different universities, but really it was another filmmaker that kind of tipped me off to an old partner of hers who had made Super 8 films. So that was just, you know, such a joy and seeing the same with the, the stills of Pauline in the Joshua Tree Desert doing the sonic meditation. I mean, there's just, I'd never seen those and it was, it was just so joyful to discover. Well, you mentioned Suzanne in the 70s. Suzanne, let's go back to the 70s and talk to me what it was, what is it really like? Obviously, you touched on this in the film, but entering such a male-dominated place, were you very conscious of your gender at that point? You know, in those days, I really, uh, there weren't even any men doing what I was doing. So I really had the play field to myself. When I, I arrived in New York on April Fool's Day in 1974, to do a live Buchla concert. And my world was encompassed, you know, by that Buchla system. That was my life. That was what I did uh, and what I cared about, what I was in love with. So I was very much in my own world. And when I came out uh, at that moment into the public, you know, it was an art gallery performance with an opening by uh, Ronald Mallory, a sculptor who works in Mercury, I was astonished that people listened. It was a quadraphonic concert, so it was immersive sound. And I just took for granted that this was, that everybody would love it. And then I entered a period of real difficulty because people did not understand it. I still feel that, you know, even though it's much better nowadays, the concepts of live performance of analog modular musical instruments is still a little bit of a subcategory of electronic music. And uh, it's not easy to get that message across. And I think that Lisa has you know, forwarded that concept by by showing us what it looked like to do that. Well, it is an educational film on so many levels for that level, as well as kind of her story, as you were saying, Lisa, and kind of filling in the terrible gaps that, that have, are there in music history, the way people are taught. What are the personal highlights for you of things that you uncovered, perhaps personalities and inspirations that you found from the women that you either met or discovered in this film? Yeah, just want to follow up with what Suzanne was saying. I think one of the, the things that I, I didn't realize that electronic music not only changed the modes of production, but it also transformed the very definition of music. And, you know, I think that these women, not only were they making cool sounds, but they really, you know, broke the boundaries of what we consider to be music today. And I think that's kind of one of the big revelations for me. I didn't really know much about electronic music. I knew that people played around on tape, but yeah, that was that was really a remarkable find. But in terms of what I learned, I think the biggest thing I learned was um, the importance of listening. This is the one thing that I think connects all of these women is their dedication to listening to sound and to the world around them. Yes, there was a moment when, was it Delia Derbyshire talking about the air raid sirens and how that inspired her? And I thought that was so fascinating. Things that you wouldn't necessarily think of, just being really alert to the sounds around you in the world. Suzanne, have you got any examples of that, the things that you pick up in, in the natural environment or otherwise? Well, for me, one of my... Um catalytic moments was when I was young, I had chronic earaches. So I had, you know, I was in pain most of the time with my ears. And I, when I went into the swimming pool, I had to wear a bathing cap and earplugs. And I was in kind of like an anechoic chamber there. And one day in the swimming pool, I took my I took off my bathing cap, I took out my earplugs, and the sound of the water just went all through me. It was, you know, it was a moment I'll never forget. And I think that that it certainly connected with my appreciation of, of sound. You know, I am a composer, so I was trained traditionally. I am a pianist. 
But my passion was in this new world of, of sound that had no, no limit in frequency and could dazzle you in the high end. And that it was lower than the low end and higher than the high end. And I, I think just this, the visceral response to sound uh, is what attracted me. That's fascinating. Thank you. I mean, we've mentioned that Suzanne's had a doc about your life. Um, and Lisa, on top of this, um, there was a documentary about Delia Darbish's life. Why do you think we're only just hearing stories like this now? I think it's because of the way we tell stories. I think that, you know, we, as humans, we long for a hero, a soul genius, you know, and that hero or that soul genius is generally white and male. And I've really, I've thought about this question a lot, and I'm really convinced that it's our reductive storytelling that is what has led to these, you know, this, the, the erasure of these women from history. And so, yeah, in the way that I decided to tell the story, I really wanted to break from that traditional, or in other words, in other words male form of storytelling with, you know, a clear beginning, a middle and end, a hero, the myth of a soul genius, I wanted a story that drew connections, that weaved, that didn't have an all-knowing narrator, that wasn't strictly chronological, and that left people with a curiosity. You know, I don't want people to think that this is the definitive history of electronic music, or a fe- sorry, a female-authored early electronic music. I don't think such a thing exists. And so what I hope is, through my challenging of this kind of traditional storytelling that, yeah, that people become more aware of, you know, of listening and also that there are lots of gaps in history and that history isn't fixed and it needs to constantly be revised. And yeah, I really see this film as a kind of stepping stone into a greater research, a greater uncovering of a female authored early electronic music to work on slow changing of the sounds. My last work, Agnos 2, is 75 minutes long, and it couldn't be shorter. It just goes like a stream. Much of our music, classical pop, has this beat, has this gallop, has this trot. I'm interested in music that communicates some ideas. I hope that is the case. I think it will be. Um, Suzanne, I also wanted to ask you a little about your work in the movies and the movie industry in general. Can you tell us a bit about that? That was one of the doors that was, for the most part, closed to women. And I was lucky in 1980, I was hired by a Hollywood film producer that was a woman. So Verna Fields had edited the blockbuster film Jaws and because she got that, uh, you know, in her, that feather in her cap, she was named head of production at Universal. And then Lily Tomlin, also a woman, of course, was making a film, and they hired me to do the score for the film. So I do believe that women in positions of power and networking can further the, the talents of other women. So I did the score. It was... Uh, It was a challenge, and oh, well, we don't need to go into all of that. I mean, we had to record in Italy. I wrote for a hundred-piece orchestra. I brought my Sinclair and all my electronics to Rome. Uh, I did every note in that score, except for one song. And uh, I thought, okay, this is good, and I had my foot in the door. Universal Pictures presents Lily Tomlin as the incredible shrinking woman. The adventure of a brave woman whose biggest problem is growing smaller by the moment. I need a hit. <laughs> you mean she shrunk since the last time I saw her? You mean she shrunk since the last time I saw her? I almost sat on her last night. Can we give you a hand, dear? No one could help her. Ah! No one could comfort her. However, I was very busy in New York doing my commercials. I had a lot of clients. And doing a film took six weeks. And doing a commercial took two days. So it was hard for me to take that time. And I was offered additional films. I was unaware 
you know, that this door had opened for me kind of exclusively because I didn't, I found out when they did an obituary for Shirley Walker, who was a female film composer. And they said she was the first woman hired to do a major Hollywood feature solo. And I said, gee, that's funny. I, I did it 12 years before she did. And then the horror struck me that no woman had been hired for those 12 years. So this, this is not a trivial thing. Those doors were closed. And it didn't matter that you had the skill that you could outright, you know, half of the guys that you saw getting the jobs. It just wasn't going to happen. Now, an addendum to this story is that because we are in the position now of researching, and as Lisa says, rewriting our her story, I discovered that there was a solo woman composer named Elizabeth Firestone in the 40s. So she got a Hollywood feature film. Uh, she was, I think, the niece of Firestone, you know, the tire baron. And I wish that I knew her story. I wish I knew how she got those feature. She did two feature films in Hollywood, and we know nothing about her. So, you know, there were women there. There were women. We have been functioning as creative people for probably always, but we haven't had visibility. And it's a real loss to other women who need to know that they're not the solo warrior, you know, in a particular field. We've all felt like solo warriors. And now we see that we're connected, that they're, you know, if only we had known that, it would have given more momentum to our uh, evolution. Well, it feels like a time of rediscovery and change, um, although I'm sorry that you didn't have that sooner. Uh, we're next speaking to uh, two contemporary electronic composers, their gazelle twin and Shiva Fesharaki. Uh, do either of you have any messages for them? Obviously they're very successful, and then perhaps for a younger woman who are just kind of starting out in this area today. I would just say, just do it. I mean, the pushback that I got making this film was remarkable. You know, I had so many people telling me, no one's going to be interested. It's too niche of a subject. Oh, but there's nobody famous in your film. The reactions, it was it was really difficult to, to get it done. But if you want it, you can do it. Brilliant advice. Suzanne, anything from you? Well, I feel the same way. And I think that uh, for young women coming up today, professionally in music, in technology, uh, the technology of music, you know, just just do your thing. You know, it is not a man's world. It never was a man's world. I still am marveling at, at people thinking that it was, you know, as if it were like a motorcycle venue or something, you know. Technology is for sensitive, you know, it takes sensitivity to, to interact with these machines. Women are, uh, you know, I don't like to make generic judgments about groups of people, of course, but I think the fact that people have called us a man's world is completely misdirected. It is not a man's world. The thing that I've always loved about electronic music is that it's in motion. It's malleable. It's a much more open set of dynamics. Wonderful. Now, finally, what are you both up to next? Where can our listeners find out more about what you're doing? Lisa? I am. I've just submitted a treatment for a fiction film, which is a, more of a personal story, but again, about female liberation. And it's a story of my mother. And I found out when she passed away when I was 18 that she was engaged to somebody before my father. I was completely in shock and took me about 25 years to get in touch with this man. But basically it was kind of amazing when she passed away, he wrote a letter to the family to, you know, obviously send his condolences, but he also opened up about why my mother had canceled the wedding two weeks before. And he told us that she wanted to participate in the 68 revolution and that that is why she broke off the wedding. So then she kind of ran off um, very shortly after to America where she created a life for herself and met my dad and had my brother and I. But I'm interested in telling the story of the, of the days right after she tells her family that she's not getting married. 
My mother grew up in a very rural part of Brittany, which is the West Coast. It's kind of like detached from the rest of France. And so I'm very interested in looking at May 68, you know, which is kind of the, the images I have in my head of May 68 are all based on photos of the students in Paris protesting. And so I'm very interested in kind of looking at that history from a rural perspective and also a personal perspective. And so the way I'm writing it is very much kind of I'm contacting my aunts and I'm, you know, I'm using, you know, archive of the time. And um, yeah, it's 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 been a really fun process, but I'm not against doing another documentary. And so there are a few ideas out there which would be so fun to do. So we shall see. Well, I'm totally sold on that one. I was just gripped <laughs> by that description, Lisa. I can't <laughs> wait to see that. It's amazing. <laughs> Suzanne, what are you up to? And, and on that subject, though, you know, I was in Berkeley in the late 60s, in 68. And so it all blended together. You know, all of the, the arrests and the uh, tear gas and the rock throwing, that was the moment that catalyzed the shift from a traditional life you know, Chopin and the piano, to an open, you know, it was, it was a, uh, a shift, a major shift in our cultural consciousness and our political consciousness. It was one of the peaks of women's liberation. We were burning bras then. And, you know, it comes in waves. And that was one of the big waves. I think we're at the crest of another wave right now. And every time that crest comes, it progresses, you know, slightly more, uh, you know, now we're getting, now we're getting relationship amongst women. Women were always isolated. You know, they were in a man's world. They were competing for a place in a man's world. Now we have a, a woman's world and we can network and we can, you know, we have a critical mass and we have our own power structure and it has nothing to do with men. It's ours. You know, it's not competitive. It's Whatever, but what I'm doing is, you know, I'm thrilled that the young people now are reinvestigating my passion, which was analog modular. And I go out now, I've been touring for five years with my bukla, playing quadraphonic concerts and meeting an audience that finally has a listening for what I'm doing. And it's just so energizing for both of us, for me, for them. Uh, so it, it's a wonderful time for me. I'm so glad I, you know, I got to live this long to experience it. Wow, you two are among my favorite guests. You are fantastic. <laughs> and you just summed up the spirit of Girls on Film so beautifully, both of you. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. And best of luck with Sisters with Transistors. I know a lot of people are loving it and I'm sure they'll continue to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Technology is just, it's a natural extension of man. Man has always played with tools. Man has always developed tools. And it is a tool. It's not, the machine doesn't write the music. You tell the machine what to do, and the machine is an extension of you. That was Suzanne Chiani and Lisa Rovner. My final two guests are musicians Shiva Fesharaki and Elizabeth Bernholz, who's otherwise known as Gazelle Twin. Shiva is an award-winning experimental composer and artist who's taken her turntable talents across the world, from the BBC Proms to the Moscow Museum of Modern Art. Elizabeth is a composer and producer known for her striking audiovisual performances as her alter ego Gazelle Twin. She recently co-created the soundtrack for the female-focused horror film, The Power. Well, Elizabeth and Shiva, welcome to Girls on Film. Hi. Hey. (laughs) Now, I believe you've met before really briefly, haven't you, Shiva? Is that right? Yeah, yeah. We we met in soundcheck and rehearsals where we were both working with the BBC Concert Orchestra. And yeah, we crossed paths at the Southbank Centre. Which feels like an age ago, actually, doesn't it? Twenty, I think it was twenty nineteen. Yeah, when yeah. the world was quite different. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's nice to reunite you remotely, and we're going to be talking about sisters with transistors. But first, I want to talk about both of your amazing work, which I've been enjoying recently. Shiva, first of all, give me a little potted biography. Tell me more about your work. Okay, so I feel like a lot of my music is this interplay between 
electronic and acoustic sound and just also kind of repurposing technologies away from what they are initially used for for creative means so if for example with turntables you know that's normally used for playing records or DJing but I use the turntables as an instrument and kind of creative techniques that treat the technology as a musical voice as a musical instrument with kind of infinite kind of directions you could take the sound electronically. But I also, yeah, work with orchestras and I kind of spatialize acoustic music in geometric forms so that you get like a really immersive experience if you're in the live space, really. So, yeah. I've been, yeah, I've been watching some of your live stuff on YouTube and it looks like trippy in the best possible way. I just imagine sort of sitting there or even lying there and listening to it and letting it kind of overwhelm you. Incredible. Elizabeth, tell us a bit more about your work. Well, I started out my sort of journey in music really hoping to become a composer for the concert hall or for film and sort of came to it fairly late in my teens um, and ended up, ended up going to university to study composition I'm at Sussex. And kind of on graduating, realised that I was really missing performing and sort of immediately threw away all the things that I'd learned and just went back to sort of improvising and performing on stage as a singer, as uh, playing flute, um, doing whatever I could, just messing around. And from that point, I kind of began to slowly produce my own music. It kind of dropped away the whole kind of idea of being a composer. I kind of, I'd, I'd sort of had a few forays into sort of composing for local groups and I, I just kind of felt really shut out from it. And I, I think because I hadn't followed a, an especially academic path, it was a fairly non, I was a fairly non-traditional composer, I think, it, to begin with. Um, and I just kind of decided just to sort of jack it all in and just try and make my own music. And I was familiar with using computer-based systems since being a kid, just introduced from my from my dad, who was, you know, had uh, computer software at home. And I kind of just began making my own sounds that kind of, in a way, sought to emulate orchestral scales and the drama of an orchestra and, you know, and in some ways kind of film scores, sort of imaginary film scores. So I came to music kind of with with a mixture of, academic education and just pure kind of drive to create music in any way that I could and this is where I'm at now really I, I think it, I've created Gazelle Twin in 2009 with the idea of trying to liberate myself from what I'd encountered with with you know trying to become a composer and, and finding it to be a very male oriented world and similarly with some of the live performances and things that I did that were slightly more off the cuff like gigs and things I found the same there too I found like there was a, a male domination there but in a slightly different way and there were there were structures that I felt were hard to break through and that weren't giving me sort of entry into the world that I wanted to be in which was kind of just to be able to create these kind of large-scale very strongly themed performances. That's kind of why I created Zell Twin and you know, this is uh, 11 years later, I'm kind of still still trying to sort of push push my way through. But um, yeah, that's that's why I'm here. Push your way through. I mean, your album was named Best Album by like about 10 different major magazines. So let's not be too modest. You've done amazingly. But you, it's really interesting that you mention about, um, you know, 
pushing through and it being very male dominated. I mean, I used to edit a dance music magazine called Wax in the 90s. And then it was very unusual to have women in the business. I was interviewing Sister Bliss and people, but that was probably about, you know, one of the few that was around. And it shocks me that still this is an issue, you know, and still when you guys were younger, this was an issue. Shiva, I'm guessing is a similar experience for you. Did you find it very male dominated when you were starting out? Oh, yeah. I mean, absolutely. I mean, as far as I can remember, I was always not only the only female composer in music college in my, you know, there's only very few female composers when I was at Royal College of Music. And then even before that, you know, and afterwards, even now, um, when I'm working on big productions, it's so male dominated. I will be the only woman you know in a production and it would be my production as well so it'd just be like me and 20 men and it's you know it's really interesting as well because when I do happen to have a collaboration with women I actually feel a lot more comfortable and I feel a lot more um like I can be myself and that I feel like I can relate more and I feel more open and less shy and and I feel like when when there's just so it, when I'm just the only person that's a woman and kind of from my background, it can be quite intimidating. But also, I feel like I think guys also when they're only working with other men and then there's someone like me, they start to behave weirdly around me. You know, it's like unusual. But in what way? Well, I think just if you're not used to day to day, if you're used to kind of just day to day working with people just like you then you're just kind of used to doing that yeah I think communication communication can be um not as straightforward I think that's a very interesting point is that it's not necessarily anyone's fault it's just that if you're used to communicating in a certain way with a certain kind of demographic and then someone comes in and shakes that up that's challenging for you and maybe they react in a certain way um, Elizabeth do you feel that there are positives that have come out of the fact that you are a minority in this industry uh, creatively? Positives, yeah. I mean, when I started out with Gazelle Twin, I, I hadn't produced anything before and I produced my first album, which is now 10 years old, in my small house in, in Brighton um, with, I think it was Ableton 7, and a really cheap microphone and a really cheap sound card. And I kind of had this voice, I, I'd always had this voice telling me that I, I needed to find a male producer. I needed to find, you know, you know, a, a top producer to sort of produce my first record. And um, it was just, it was just the dialogue that I'd always had, and I'd always kind of just had internally, let alone with, you know, like other people in the music industry. And at that time, I was, I was finding people in Brighton that were kind of connected to the industry, and you know, going up kind of quite highly in the ranks and that you know there were some roots into it that that were really useful but I still felt still felt a bit weird like I still had to kind of prove myself through you know someone else getting involved through you know in most cases a man sort of taking on my music and, and making it better or whatever and when I just decided just my part mostly at the time through practical means and through financial means I just had to do it myself I just sort of had a bit of a eureka moment because I I did it and you know I knew that I could do it and I knew that I could compose but I didn't think that I would you know make be able to make a record in my house that would you know go on to vinyl and go into to sell in shops and go on to sort of get you know decent reviews and stuff so the positives that came out of that I mean that's the trajectory that I'm on now and that's the momentum that it gave me just that first sort of leap into the dark and to just even without the full self-belief that I kind of may have now 10 years later I, I still did it and I think it inspired me to just push harder and harder to to do more myself actually um, and to and to think more about okay someone may want to work with me and they're a man should I do this or should I just should I just do it myself just to you know just to make sure that I can stand my ground so yeah, I'd say that's a positive. I just think just in terms of my own confidence and then, you know, simultaneously maybe inspiring others to do the same to, when they think that they they can't or they, they need someone else to help them. Well, this is like a, a hugely important thing that we're always saying on Girls on Film, if she can see it, she can be it. And in every aspect of the industry, it's so important 
the people starting out, young women can see people doing what you guys are doing, which is amazing. I mean, Sisters with Trans Sisters is a great example, although unfortunately half these women have been hidden from mainstream history. Let's talk a little bit about the film. I mean, Shiva, what's your connection to it? Because I know you've been sort of involved in some ways. I've been really sort of minorly involved, if I'm honest. Lisa Rovner has, since about 2015, um, that she's been starting to create the film. She's been coming to a lot of my concerts, um, especially around the premieres I've been doing with Daphne Ulrich and Still Point. And she's been really kind of staying in touch. And yeah, we've just been kind of informally kind of in touch about the film and she's been coming to to the different moments of the kind of realization of Daphne Oram's composition and just really getting herself immersed in that world and really getting as much knowledge as possible around Daphne Oram from myself and my colleagues. That's how I know of her film and her work. And it's just been, yeah, it's amazing. It's an absolutely amazing film. And so happy to have a very small role in it. It is an extraordinary film. And, you know, I learned so much and it's it's entertaining, it's intriguing, it's surprising. Elizabeth, tell me what you felt when you saw it. I wasn't prepared for how sad I would feel watching it, actually, just from the first sort of 20 minutes I was completely sucked in and and nodding nodding my head off yeah. just like yeah yeah yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah yeah just thinking god I've never you know I think this and I talk about this among you know other fellow women composers and electronic artists but I've never actually really heard anyone say this kind of on you know on film and anything so kind of you know permanent as a as a film composers were old white dead men I always wanted to do something in the arts that had to do with the real authentic experience of being alive. Listening is the basis of creativity and culture. And how a community of people listen is what creates their culture. I kind of felt simultaneously inspired and relieved and, and sad at the same time, just at the incredible steps these women took towards where we are now in music and how we're only just catching up with their names, let alone the work that they've done and hearing their music, you know, that she, she has been resurrecting these amazing compositions. It's just, yeah, it's just kind of deeply sad as well as brilliant. Yeah, I have to say that I completely felt the same. Actually, I had several goes at watching it and I had to keep I just wasn't emotionally ready for it. So it took me a while to actually to watch it just because the emotions were so high and so kind of, yeah, there was a lot of emotion. So I, yeah, I kept trying to watch it and then putting it off until I finally felt like, okay, now's the time to watch it. Just also because I've met Eliane Radig and, you know, I feel so kind of close to to all of these amazing women. They've, they've all been such amazing role models for me and I've learned so much. You know, like my life really did change when I came across composers like Daphne Oram and Pauline Oliveris and Eliane Radig. You know, it really did have a transformative effect on my confidence, on my inspiration in, in my work, but also just how much I related to it. Because I was like, oh, yeah, but I'm also like inventing things in my home studio. And Daphne Oram is noted to have had the very first home studio in this country. So she actually kind of invented the home studio <laughs> vibe. You know, she had her studio in her basement in her Kent home where she invented one of the very first synthesizers. And, you know, nobody really was paying any attention to the fact that she has had done this and it was an optical synthesizer. So she was connecting lights and visuals with with electronic sound all the way back in the 60s. And to think like what she was contending with and to think of all these incredible 
groundbreaking, moving compositions and electronic music that she was creating. And it was just, you know, it's only now that we're appreciating it, but also it's just, it was so cutting edge that it's only now that we're even getting to grips with it. But the great works of art are a projection of a human mind. And unless this machine can produce exactly this projection of the composer thought, then I can quite see why people can get frightened at the thought. Do either of you feel that you were ever taught about these women or did you have to go and find out about them yourselves? No way. No way. I mean, I I honestly didn't know of them until maybe even sort of five or six years ago. And even now still learning um, about them and not, you know, not deliberately actually, just that, that they keep coming round in my circle. And... Yeah, I, I couldn't believe that. <laughs> I had no idea. And I, th- I think it was Delia Derbyshire's, one of her experiments that came to my attention that was kind of dubbed as like the first techno track or something way before, you know, techno. I, I don't know if that's correct, but so there's, it's just this incredible throbbing electronic pulse and it is, it's really amazing. And I couldn't believe, you know, that she'd made this in, in the sort of 60s or 70s. And it kind of exploded my mind. I just couldn't. I just couldn't believe I'd never heard of this name before. Why do you think this particular kind of music is perhaps particularly in people's minds associated with masculinity completely wrongly? Why is that? I, I don't know. I mean, it's a, it's a scientific, technical, mathematical thing that I think you know. Perhaps that has something to do with it that you know women women aren't meant to be working with machines. And you know, you know, they're not scientists. They're not, you know, they're not engineers. They're none of these are roles that kind of you automatically think of women, I guess, is one element of it. Yeah, absolutely. The norms and values of even now our society is the initial subconscious thought of women not being associated with these technologies, with these means. And, you know, that whole kind of boys club of geekery and feeling quite comfortable. And it goes back to what I was saying about, you know, the communication thing because the men that I work with they're wonderful and they're really great to work with but they have for for many decades had the culture of geeking out with each other not really including women have not been included when I was at school there were also boys in the music tech room who were geeking out to the, the music tech and you know I was not I was not involved in that and I wouldn't have been able to be involved but I'm glad I wasn't because I was doing it all on my own and therefore because I was doing it on my own in my own time with my own freedom I was able to come up you know that's where the growth comes that's where the creative growth comes with doing it your own way and do and inventing things for your own means because you love it because you're passionate about it it's got nothing to do with other people it's got nothing to do with some boys club or a a geeky club you know it's your all it's your own curiosity but I also feel like that's why women such as Daphne Oram and Eliane Radig and um, these amazing composers and electronic pioneers that are in the film did such pioneering and incredible work because a lot of these women had backgrounds in classical music training just like me and you Elizabeth but they just and same, just like us, they weren't included in, in the orchestral rehearsals and the orchestral commissions. And they were all trained. Eliane Radig was a classical, classically trained harpist. Daphne Oram also um, was declined a place to study composition at the Royal College of Music because she knew that up until the 90s, so that's 50, 40 years, 50 years after Daphne Oram's time, um, at college, is treated as a finishing school for women. It was treated as somewhere where you go and you finish. But she obviously didn't want to be doing that, so she declined her place. But the point I'm trying to make is um, because they were working independently, they were able to come up with all of these amazingly inventive ways of being creative, being musicians, and at the dawn of using electricity with sound. And it was just, it's just such a radical and exciting time. And these women were really pioneers. Beautifully put, may I say. And is there anything else that either of you want to say about the film? It's kind of just touching on what you just said, Shiva. I think just the idea of being able to create 
in solitude and being kind of totally free to get to know this technology and to push our ideas and creativity through it in the way that we just figure out, you know, in our own space rather than, you know, with any kind of, dare I say, mansplaining or, you know, or academic approach. It's just it's just something that, and I'm talking about anything from, you know, from analogue um, technology to digital technology, there's there's ways to interact with it that, that are very natural and tactile. And, you know, you talk about your turntable as being an instrument, Shiva, and I, I, use, I use my microphone as an instrument, really. I use my, my voice. I, I compose primarily through my voice, but my microphone is the thing that I sing into but then use to, you know, capture that and to then, you know, use my software to then augment my voice or, or you know, change my voice and distort it and push it into different genders or things like that. I just, I, I try and use it to just let the creativity flow out of me. I just think it's that kind of unique situation where you have this technology that the, the technology allows this this approach to composition and to access this kind of bigger network of sounds. And I talked earlier about how I've always wanted to create a classical, almost you know, classical orchestral scale of music, but have never had you know the, the ability to just you know like write a piece of music for an orchestra and get it and played and, and hear it. And I think. Um, Something in the film that that really struck me was that one of them I can't remember which which person it was that mentioned that but the the idea of just being able to hear your own music your own compositions was so rare <laughs> in that kind of world but to be able to do that it might, I think it was Suzanne Chani that said this actually and that you know suddenly you have these these machines at your fingertips that can do everything that you tell them to and you can hear it straight away and you can you know you can appreciate it and you can you know experience it there and then so the technology that that is available to us now, even that it's, it's on our phones now. I mean, we don't need these massive, beautiful synthesizers. We've got them on our phones. You know, we can we can create anywhere we want to and in the way that we want to. It doesn't have to be dictated to us. So musical technology can be very powerful for women in a patriarchy. Yeah, I mean, it can be powerful to anyone who 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 is who is kind of hasn't got access to say can't get to music college or can't get to a university or can't afford you know music lessons. I don't know. It's just it's there to just to just be consumed and used and warped and built on. It's more egalitarian. Yeah. Yeah, to infinite proportions in any context or. It is amazing technology can afford us that freedom. Well, listen, I could talk about that all day, but we're going to have to wrap up. And I want to know what you are both up to next. Elizabeth, I'm going to start with you because I really enjoyed your work on the film The Power, which has a great feminist message. Congratulations for that. Something chased me to the basement. When I looked, there was no one there. Are you just making this up? No, I'm not making it up. A nurse must give of herself entirely. Sacrifice. How much are you willing to give? Who is she? Give. What does she want? Val, now listen to me. And you're sent by God to guide me. Are you doing any more film work and or anything else you'd like to share with us? I'm I'm trying to get into more film work. Yeah, I've kind of come full circle from my my sort of childhood dream of being a film composer. I'm now ending up doing films, but in the way that I want to do them, which is really great. Yeah, hopefully. And I'm I'm actually working on a another album, which I hope will have an orchestral element. So, you know, if the world sort of can try and get back to normal-ish by next year, then hopefully that will happen. Fingers crossed. I hope so. Thank you. And Shiva, what do you got next? So on May 15th, I'm going to Frankfurt to record my composition Opus Infinity with Ensemble Modern. And that's like a really deeply spatialised, immersive composition that kind of works with the universal patterns that 
of vibration and kind of just trying to think of the mathematical patterns of the universe and create a composition. But um, it will be streamed to the live performance, but that's kind of good because it means more people can actually listen to it. So if people find your social media on your website, they'll be able to watch that. Yeah, yeah, Great. absolutely. We'll definitely Great. link to that. Brilliant. Well, I am in awe of both of you and thank you so much for joining Girls on Film to talk about your work and Sisters with Transistors. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. That was the wonderful gazelle twin and Shiva Fasharaki. You can watch Sisters with Transistors on digital now and you can pre-book tickets to see it on the big screen in the UK. Finally, cinemas are reopening. Just visit modernfilms.com for details. Do follow us on social media if you want to keep in touch and get some daily film recommendations. And also do pop over to our Patreon page if you fancy watching some extra video interviews. We're at patreon.com forward slash girls on film podcast. Girls on Film is an 8LA production. Brought to you by executive producer Hedda Archbold, audio producer Emma Butt, assistant producers Heather Dempsey and Eliana J, and our partners for this episode, Modern Films. You've been listening to me, Anna Smith, and I was joined by Lisa Rovner, Suzanne Chiani, Elizabeth Bernholz, and Shiva Fesharaki. See you soon and stay safe, everyone. This is the story of women who hear music in their heads, of radical sounds, 